Hi everyone, and welcome back to a supplementary video for the New Testament survey course. This is a supplement to our survey of Paul's epistle to the Ephesians. In this section, we'll look in more detail at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. This passage contains one of Paul's most profound descriptions of our salvation and its reasons. It lays out a dramatic before and after picture of our lives and gives the big picture cosmic reason why we are saved. And so, this is an, an important passage for us to consider in some more detail. I invite you to open your Bible and follow along closely as we read and then work through these verses so that you can see it for yourself. This passage says, Even though you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you lived, according to the standard of this world, according to the ruler of the domain of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, we all also once behaved in this way, in the desires of our flesh, doing the will of the sinful nature in this way of thinking. And just like the rest, we also were by nature children of wrath. But God, being rich in mercy because of his profound love with which he loved us, even though we also were dead in transgressions, he made us alive with Christ. By grace you've been saved. And he raised us up with Christ, and he sat us with Christ in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that he would show the extraordinary riches of his grace in the coming ages in his goodness to us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you are completely saved through faith. And this is not from you, it is the gift of God. It is not from works, so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we may walk in them. Now, I encourage you to follow along in your own Bible as we work through this passage. But first, let's put this passage in its wider context. It is from the first half of Ephesians, the doctrine portion, where Paul was describing all the spiritual blessings which believers receive from Christ. Paul had thanked God for all the spiritual blessings and listed many of them, and then he prayed that the Ephesians would know, experience, and live out all that he had described. And then is our passage here, where he described the great change in believers' lives, that our relationship with God is transformed by His grace. And this is followed by the section where he described the great change in a relationship to other believers, no matter what ethnic or cultural groups are involved, followed by more prayer. And then the epistle goes on from there to describe how we should live in light of our spiritual blessings. So this passage is in the middle of Paul's description of the great things God has done and is doing in the lives of all genuine Christians. Now, let me give you a general outline of this passage before we go through it in detail. First, in verses 1 through 7, Paul wrote about how God has given us participation in the victory of Christ and described all that he meant by that. And then in the last three verses, he gave more detail about the overall reason for this, that is, God's grace. The first section, about our participation in Christ's victory, is divided into two main subsections, which are like a before and after description. Before Christ, we were dead in sins and under God's wrath. But even though that was true, God made us alive with Christ and participants in all that he accomplished, because of God's great mercy, love, and grace, and in order to display his glorious grace. And in the second section, Paul emphasized that we are saved purely by grace and not by works. But that does not mean that good works are optional, because at the end of this passage, Paul insisted that we were created and saved so that we could live out a lifestyle of good works, which God had prepared for us. Now, let's work through the passage in more detail. As I mentioned, Paul wrote that we've been given participation in the victory of Christ, and he will describe exactly what that means a little bit later, but first, in verses 1 through 3, he highlighted the opposite. He made a contrast to show the dramatic change which those who are in Christ have experienced. 
And as I said, this is like a before and after comparison. He highlighted the ugly, ugly, ugly picture of how it was before so that we could truly appreciate how beautiful it is after. Because the change that God made in our lives is both unprecedented and undeserved. God did all this for us, even though we were dead in transgressions and sins. It says we were dead, spiritually dead, in the manner that Paul is going to describe. Everybody agrees that Paul didn't mean that we were physically dead. But some people do object to the idea that we were dead spiritually. They insist that this must be just figurative or metaphorical, because if we were truly spiritually dead, we would not be able to respond to Christ. Now, I understand that objection, and it seems to make logical sense. But let's make a little comparison. In John chapter 11, Jesus called to Lazarus, who had been dead for four days, and Lazarus came out from the grave. If we use that same kind of logic, we would have to say that Lazarus was not really dead, or he would not have heard and responded to Jesus' command. But that would completely miss the point. Jesus' command to Lazarus was miraculous. The command gave the new life and ability to respond. In the same way, the fact we were saved from our spiritual death is miraculous and in no way was dependent on our ability to respond. And Paul clearly said that we were dead in our transgressions and sins, and we need to take his language seriously. The point is that it is a miracle of grace that we are saved, because we were in no position to save ourselves or even to merit rescue. We were dead. We had nothing to offer. We could do nothing. And Paul elaborated on what he meant by us being dead. He said we were dead in transgressions and sins. Sins are anything that goes against or fails to live up to God's will. And at the heart of every sin is the attitude that we don't want to submit to God's standards of right and wrong, and so we make our own. Because we have a differing opinion on whatever issue, we don't like God being the one who has the authority to decide what is right and wrong. And so, at least on that particular issue, we reject him and put ourselves in the place of authority to decide, based on our preferences. And so, sin is basically cosmic rebellion, rejecting the real God as king and master, and trying to make ourselves the boss in his place. And the word transgressions does refer to a specific type of sin, and the emphasis is that we cross a boundary into something forbidden by God. We go over the line, outside of what is right and true, into what is sinful and wrong. And Paul said that we walked in these things. We had a sinful, transgressive lifestyle. Now, in the survey of Ephesians, we talked about the key word walk, which refers to a lifestyle. Paul used this word throughout the letter, uh, to describe the lifestyle that Christians should live. But in this verse, he used that same word to note the kind of lifestyle that we used to live when we were dead. We walked in transgressions and sins. We did not just occasionally sin, but our lifestyle was primarily characterized by sin and transgression. That is what defined our lifestyle. And Paul elaborated that even further. He said that we walked according to the standard of this world. Literally, this says, according to the ages of this world. Remember, we talked in this course about their understanding of two ages, this age, characterized by evil and injustice, and the coming age, characterized by goodness and righteousness and justice. Well, Paul here said, we were living in line with the evil and unjust age. We were contributing factors in all that is wrong with the world. Our lifestyle was defined by the standards and thought patterns of this age, with disastrous results. But not only did we walk according to the standards of this age, he said we also walked according to the ruler of this age, 
who is the devil. Paul called him the one ruling the domain of the air. What does that mean? Well, the domain, or sometimes said authority, that is the sphere in which power is exercised. And the word air that he used is not referring to the stuff that we breathe, but it refers to the area between earth and heaven, which in that day was thought to be the battleground between good and evil forces, and temporarily inhabited by evil forces in this age. In other words, the devil, Paul said, is the one with ruling influence in all that is evil and opposing God. But he's also described here as the spirit now working in the sons of disobedience. Sons of disobedience are all those who are characterized by disobedience, which is everybody without Christ. Everyone without the ruling influence of Christ, according to Paul, is under the ruling influence of the devil, which results in a lifestyle of disobedience. And continuing on, our sinful lifestyle produced sinful conduct. We all behaved in this way, in transgressions and sins. And Paul intentionally included the word all, so that there are none of us who can exclude ourselves from this description. Now, the different word that he used for behaving, it still refers to an ongoing lifestyle, but with more of a focus on daily behavior, the way we normally conduct ourselves. And he defined that conduct as living out the desires of our sinful nature. This is sometimes translated lusts of the flesh, but it is not limited to physical pleasures. It is the desires of our selfish fallen nature, which sees and calculates everything from a self-centered standpoint, which automatically puts God in second place at best. And so, these desires are twisted, selfish desires, craving for something forbidden. In chapter 4, verse 22, Paul said that we were being corrupted by these deceitful desires. And here, Paul noted that we habitually did the will of the sinful nature and this worldly mindset. That is, the mindset of fallen humanity that ignores God and does not honor him as God. Later in this book, Paul will use that same word to say that humanity is darkened in their understanding, that is, in their mindset, without Christ. And because we all had that self-centered mindset, we did those self-centered sinful things because they were the natural things to do. Now, I know you might be thinking, Come on, Paul. It's not that bleak. I'm not that bad. Cut me some slack. But I want to encourage all of us to be honest with ourselves. If you've ever seriously attempted to live up to God's standards in any area of your life, then you know how hard it is. Because there's just something in us that rebels against us. Something that says, no, I want to do it my way. And if we're honest, we've seen the spoiled, selfish child that lives in all of our hearts. That is, our sinful nature, which we once completely lived in, and with which we still struggle, even as Christians. If you don't see that, if you don't acknowledge your own sinfulness, then I think you've never seriously tried to do what is right consistently, never tried to live for God, and I question if you are a genuine believer because Jesus did not come to save the healthy, but those who acknowledge they are sick. And Paul said the result of our sinful lifestyle and sinful conduct is the wrath of God. He said that we were, by nature, children of wrath, just like everyone else. Children of wrath means those who are characterized as being under wrath. Paul said that we were under wrath by nature. Now, some people say that we're all children of God, but that's not biblical. We're all creatures of God under his general care and common grace, and we all bear the image of God so that we should treat everyone with an inherent dignity and inalienable rights as humans. But unless someone is adopted into God's family through Christ, they're not a child of God but a child of wrath. All humanity, as the result of the fall into sin, 
is under slavery to sin and disobedient to God. And in Ephesians chapter 5 or 6, Paul wrote that God's wrath comes on all such disobedience. Just like we saw in Romans, all have sinned and God's wrath is revealed against all sin. The point of all this is that we all, without exception, were slaves to sin and under God's wrath. And I know that that seems like a harsh and depressing diagnosis. And the reason is because it is a harsh and depressing diagnosis. But it is true. And we were in a harsh and desperate situation without Christ. And that was true of all of us at one time, and still true for many, many people. And that's a hopeless situation, with no hope that we could ever get out of it on our own. See, God does not help those who help themselves, because none of us can help ourselves. And Paul made a point to show us the bleakness of our situation. Partly because, like Jesus said, only those who realize and acknowledge they are sick will seek a cure, but also in order to contrast it with the greatness of the change that Jesus brought. See, if Lazarus were only sleeping, anybody could have woken him up. But that's not a miracle. An alarm clock could do that. It's only because Lazarus was actually dead and Jesus raised him back to life does it show how great Jesus is. And only because we were actually dead in sin does it show how great a thing God has done in our lives. So beware of thinking that you were almost good enough and just needed Jesus to provide the the boost to nudge you over the top of your own salvation. If we think that we can contribute even the smallest thing to our own salvation, we're thinking like the Pharisees. We contributed nothing. We were dead. We were so far from being saved, we couldn't even find it on the map. We were dead. Therefore, what happened to us is a miracle, which only God could do. And the great news is that He did. I am so thankful that this passage does not end here at verse 3, because God's story does not end here. And so our lives do not need to end here in this before picture hopelessness. Because Paul continued in verse 4. Even though all these things were true of us, even though we were dead with no hope and no ability to find life, God helps those who could not help themselves. But God made us alive. This is contrary to expectations, and it's contrary to bare justice because we did not deserve it. But as Paul highlighted, it is purely because of God's mercy and love. He said God is rich in mercy. It is the nature and character of God to be merciful and compassionate. This is not something that God has done begrudgingly, but it flows from his essential character. And he is rich in mercy. He has mercy in abundance, in overflow amounts. Later in this passage, using that same word, Paul will speak of the riches of his grace. And not only that, but Paul says it is because of God's great love with which he loved us. Again, this is pure overflow of God's loving nature into God's loving attitude and action. And Paul said it is a great love, huge on a scale of extent, strong love, love to a profound degree. And he loved us with this love. All that Paul is about to describe is a result of God's mercy and love. But in light of all that he wrote in the first three verses, we're reminded that it is not because we were lovable, because we were dead. In spite of our deadness and sin, God loved us, because he is loving and merciful. Then in verse 5, Paul began to describe all that God has done for us in Christ giving us participation in Christ and his victory. He made us alive with him, he raised us up with him, and he seated us with him in the heavenly realms. 
We'll look at each of these three in a moment, but first I want to mention something about all three together. Paul didn't just say that he made us alive, raised us, and seated us in heaven. Rather, he said he made us alive with him, raised us with him, and seated us with him. As a matter of fact, Paul used compound words that have the idea of with him built into the words he used. That raises the question, why did he use those particular words? Why did he emphasize this? Well, to answer that, we need to look back at the larger context of Ephesians. Right before this passage, in the last part of chapter 1, Paul prayed that the Ephesians would be empowered to know and experience what he called the riches of God's glorious inheritance in the saints. And that included that they would know and experience his incomparably great power for us who believe. Paul then went on to define and describe that power as the power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the place of power in the heavenly realms. Did you see the connection? In chapter 1, God's great power raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the heavenly realms. And in this chapter, that same miraculous power of God made us alive with him, in contrast to our being dead in sins, and raised us with him and seated us with him. Paul took those same words he used in chapter 1 for Christ being raised and seated at God's right hand, stuck the word with on them, and used those words to describe what God has done for us. He has given us participation in what Christ did. He has made us alive with. He has raised us with, and he has seated us with. God has united us with Christ and made us participants in all the spiritual blessings which he has procured. All the spiritual blessings we experience are because of Christ, are in Christ, and are with Christ. Now, let's look more particularly at each of these three things. First, God made us alive with Christ. Now, before Paul stated that, he reiterated the fact that we were dead in transgressions. He resumed the argument, began in verse 1, by repeating that same phrase. Even though we were dead, against expectations and against what we deserve, God made us alive. We have been made alive. Though we were dead, that is no longer the case for those who are in Christ. We have new life in Christ, through the new birth, through God's salvation. This is the extremes of before and after. Once dead, now alive. Once slave to the ruler and standards of this world and our sinful desires, now free. Once no life and no hope, now full of life and participation in the riches of his glorious inheritance and every spiritual blessing in Christ. God has taken dead people and made them alive in him. And because of this, Paul then immediately interjected the reason for all this. You've been saved by grace. Like I said, this almost seems like an intrusion into his flow of thought. As he was describing all that God did, Paul just had to express his marvel at God's grace, which did it. He said, we're saved, and we need to examine, think about what that means. What does it mean to be saved? Christians talk a lot about being saved, but have we really thought about what that means? Well, this word saved is actually a fairly generic word that means to be rescued in some way. So in order to understand this, we must look at the bigger context in order to ask, what are we saved from and what are we saved for? As we saw earlier in this passage, we're saved from our transgressions and sins and the resulting wrath of God against us in our dead state of serving sin and the devil. We're saved from living according to the standards of this world we're saved from living under the evil ruler of this sinful age. 
we are saved from living according to the desires and mindset of our sinful nature, we are no longer children of wrath, but we are children of God. And so many other things in the rest of the New Testament that it describes we are saved from. And later in this passage, Paul is going to highlight one of the things that we are saved for. But here he also emphasized that we are saved by grace. That is God's grace. His gracious generosity to us, not only in his mercy, not giving us the wrath we deserved, but in his love giving us new life and participation in Christ's victory, which we did not deserve. As Paul will remind us again, we've been saved by grace. And then he went on to say that we were raised with him. Like I mentioned, this is the same word Paul used in chapter 1, verse 20, that God raised Christ. He just added the word with to it. And the New Testament consistently says, because Christ was raised from the dead, bringing about this new kind of life, all his people will experience this same life in the next age. But Paul didn't say that we will be raised, but here he said, we have been raised. This is in the already not yet tension, and we can partially experience it here and now. In other passages, we'll look more closely at what it means to be raised with him. But suffice it to say that in some way, we share in the victory of Christ's resurrection from the dead and the new life that he brought about. Not only that, Paul went on to say that we have been seated with him in the heavenly realms. As he wrote in chapter 1, Christ is now seated above every other authority in heaven and on earth. Now, that does not mean that we as individuals exercise that authority with Christ. God is wise enough to not give us that kind of power. But it means that we share in the benefits of Christ ruling with that authority. And as we saw in the survey of Ephesians, that means that we don't need to go through any mediating powers or authorities to get to Christ. We already have access above these principalities and powers, right to the very top, the one who has all the power. So we don't need to fear the evil powers, and we don't need to rely on the good ones. We can go straight to Christ, because he has seated us with him in his place of power. All that is how Paul described what God has done for us in Christ, in rescuing us from death, and giving us participation in Christ's victory, as well as the reason behind why he did it. Our salvation by grace means that we have been made alive, raised with him, and seated with him. And now, in verse 7, Paul goes on to tell the purpose for which God has done all these things. In other words, we learn not only the contrast between the way it was and the way it is now, but we also learn the way it will be. We've seen the past contrasted with the present, and now Paul gives us a peek into the future. We've seen the before and the after, now we see the coming attraction. God did all this in order that he would demonstrate the extraordinary riches of his grace in the coming age by his goodness to us in Christ. That means that for all eternity, he will continue to pour out his goodness on us from an infinite supply of his grace and greatness. That's just beyond my ability to, to imagine, because it will come from his inexhaustible riches. We will be the recipients of God's benevolence forever. And this will be our experience in the coming age, by contrast with the age of this evil world according to which we lived in the past, that is certainly something to look forward to. However, notice that giving his goodness to us is not his ultimate purpose. Now, trust me, I'm not complaining at all. But his ultimate purpose is to display the riches of his grace, that his greatness and goodness will be publicly displayed for all the universe through his kindness to us, and that all will know and acknowledge his glory. The recipients of his grace will know, 
but even all his enemies will know and acknowledge his goodness and grace, even though they won't experience it. We are to be eternally displayed in God's cosmic trophy case as recipients of his undeserved mercy and grace in order to show his glory. To display that he is the kind of God who could and who would rescue even dead sinners like you and I. He can change our dead before to our alive after and even into our glorious future so that he gets the glory and praise for all eternity. Remember that part of the purpose of Ephesians, like Colossians, is to argue that Christ is greater than any other supposed power or authority or God in the heavenly realms. And that is also God's eternal purpose, like we saw in the Old Testament. God's design is that the entire universe would know and acknowledge that he is the Lord. And one of the ways that he will do that is by displaying the riches of his grace to us in the age to come. Not only are we now participating in the victory of Christ, for all eternity we will fully participate in the fullness of the victory of Christ and know him better. Then, in the next major section, starting in verse 8, Paul returned to the foundational reason for God doing all this. You are saved by grace. He had already stated this back in verse 5, but now he elaborated in more detail what this means. First, it is by grace. This phrase, by grace, is actually first in the sentence for emphasis. By grace you are saved. God's grace is the cause of our salvation. It is purely by God's goodness and giving character that any of us are saved. Earlier in chapter 1, Paul said that we have redemption through his blood, which brings the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace, which he lavished on us. Throughout the New Testament, the consistent message is that we are debtors to God's grace. None of what we have could have come on our own, and God did not have to do what he did for us. But he did, solely because of his gracious love shown in Christ. So we need to beware of taking this for granted and subtly believing that somehow we deserve this more than the other guy. We don't deserve this in any way. It is all of grace. And Paul helps protect us from that kind of idea by what he'll say later in, the, in this passage. By this grace, he said, you are saved. Literally, it says something like, you are in a state of having been saved. It is stated as a completed, comprehensive action. Now, we know from the rest of the New Testament that our experience of our salvation is growing and someday will be fully consummated. But here, Paul stressed the fact of our salvation in Christ by God's grace. It is a definitive accomplishment, even if we don't yet fully experience all that it entails. If we have genuinely believed in Jesus, we are in the after reality of the dead alive contrast. We are alive, raised, and seated with Christ. It is a done deal. And he goes on, we are saved through faith. Faith is the instrument the grace uses to save us. The grammar that Paul used distinguishes the role of grace and faith in our salvation. Grace is the cause of our salvation, and faith is the instrument. Let me explain. The idea of an instrument is something that is used in order to accomplish something else. For instance, if I took a hammer and used it to drive a nail, I would be the cause of the nail going in, but the hammer would be the instrument I used to do it. In this case, faith was instrumental in our salvation. It was the means by which we came to salvation, but it is not the cause of our salvation. Our faith is how we received what God does in us, but it is not what works our salvation. We, we don't do anything. We just trust and accept what God has already done 
on our behalf. And Paul continued to spell this out more clearly. He said, this is not from ourselves. We didn't do it. We were not the key player in our salvation. We cannot take credit for it. Now, it's debated somewhat, but the grammar Paul used most likely shows that the word this refers not just to salvation, but to the entire sentence. It refers to the totality of our salvation, including the grace and the faith. All of that is not from us, because it is all the gift of God. Not from us, but from God. It is all God's gift. As we saw in Romans, salvation is a freely given gift, not because of anything we have done or will do in the future. It is entirely from grace. It is entirely from God. Again, Paul reinforced this by insisting that it is not from works. We saw that the entire book of Galatians is an argument against the idea that our works have anything to contribute to the cause of our salvation. We do not, indeed we cannot, do anything to contribute to our salvation. How could we? We were dead. Like Lazarus, we did not make ourselves alive, but we were made alive without our help being necessary. And the result of all this, Paul said, is that no one can boast in their salvation. No one has earned salvation. No one has qualified for salvation any more than anyone else. We are not saved because we're smarter, wiser, or better looking. It's not because of what we have to offer. It's not because of anything related to us. None of these things explain your salvation. Only grace does. And so we should reject the temptation to pinch even the smallest part of God's glory for ourselves. God did not get a good deal when he saved me or you. We have nothing to brag about. God alone gets the glory for our salvation. And he purposely designed salvation to exclude the possibility of humans taking credit for it. He will not allow the possibility of any human boasting in his presence about our salvation. Now, can you see how this is such an important passage in the New Testament for understanding our salvation? Some people falsely think that they can be good enough or behave well enough for God to save them. But Paul says we were all dead with nothing to offer and no chance of changing anything on our own. And many people falsely think that they somehow have to be good enough or behave well enough for God to save them. And we're all tempted to think that somehow we need to do at least something to earn or deserve our salvation. But in this passage, Paul makes clear that it is completely by grace, through faith, not by works at all. And that is great news for all of us, because we're not good enough to earn it. It's great news for all of us who cannot ever be good enough. God's grace is great enough for the worst of sinners, and God's grace is necessary even for the most virtuous of good people, because we all fall short. So we should stop thinking that way and refuse to try to earn it. Rather, we should just trust Christ, who has already provided all we need. We should just be grateful that God would save a wretch like me and live out the salvation we've been given. And that brings us to verse 10, where Paul ended with the underlying explanation and purpose for our salvation. The reason is that we are God's workmanship. God made us. God planned and created all that we are, including our salvation. Paul wrote that we are created in Christ Jesus for this, not just for salvation, but for good works, which are the result of our salvation. Now, he had already made it very clear that we are not saved because of good works. We are not saved by our good works. But here he mentioned that we are saved for good works. Good works do not cause our salvation, but our salvation results in good works. Works never produce salvation, but salvation produces transformed people who produce good works. 
If we are genuinely saved, if we have new life from Christ, we will do good things. We will act out the godly behavior that comes from the godly change in our character by the work of God's Spirit in our lives. Because these good works were planned by God ahead of time. We were created for these works, and these works were prepared for us. So we're not able to take credit for these good works either, because God prepared them beforehand. But he did it with the purpose that we would live them out. Literally, it says that we would walk in them. You might remember walk is that key word in Ephesians. We used to walk in transgressions and sins, but now we are to walk in good works. And the rest of Ephesians describes some of the specific ways we're to walk, in ways that are pleasing to God, in a manner worthy of the calling we've received. As Martin Luther once said, we're saved by grace through faith alone, but not by faith that is alone. In other words, genuine faith will be accompanied by good works, because God's grace changes our lives so that we live out the good works He's created us to do. So, that is our passage. God has given us participation in the victory of Christ, taking us from our before state of being dead in transgressions and living under the rule of this sinful world and under the wrath of God, and giving us our after state of being alive with Christ, being raised with Christ, and being seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. All this because of God's great mercy and love and grace, and for the purpose of being a display of God's goodness and glory for all eternity. It is by grace that we've been saved. This is nothing we did and nothing we can take credit for. It is all a gift of God. And we respond with faith and by walking out the good works that God has prepared for us. All right, so how should we react to all this? What difference should this make in our lives? Let me give you just a few suggestions. First, when we look back at where we were and contrast it with where God has brought us and where He is bringing us, we should be overwhelmed with gratitude. Our before and after picture is from the darkest depths of hell to the brightest heights of heaven. We should never forget where we have come from and where we are going and continually thank God for that dramatic change. And that should also make us humble, because we were dead and objects of wrath, just like all the rest. We did nothing to deserve or bring about our salvation. It is not by works, so that no one should boast. So, we should not be proud before God. But neither should we be proud before other people. As the old saying goes, there but for the grace of God go I. If it were not for God's grace, I would still be dead in transgressions. I have nothing to brag about on my own. And we should respond with faith, trusting Christ for all our salvation, relying completely on His love and grace and the atonement which Christ has completely provided for our salvation. We trust completely in Him and not in ourselves, because our works do not contribute to our salvation. It is the gift of God, and so we trust completely in Him. Now, another very appropriate response is heartfelt worship. It is fitting that we should praise God for such marvelous salvation, and as we saw, for all eternity, God will display His glory and grace, and the proper response is adoration. And we don't need to wait for eternity to do that. The famous catechism says that the purpose for mankind is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. So, what are we waiting for? And finally, we should find and zealously live out the good works which God has prepared in advance for us. Now, each of us is different, and the specific good works will depend somewhat on our circumstances and abilities and opportunities, but we can trust that God has tailor made good works for us to do, many of which are generally described in the rest of the New Testament. And there are some things it says we should all do. We should obediently and conscientiously do these 
as an act of faith and gratitude for all that God has done in rescuing us from death and bringing us to new life. And like Luther said, sometimes the way that God loves our neighbor is through the good works that he prepared for us to do for their sake. Now, these are just some of the ways that we could respond to all the marvelous truths that Paul has told us in this passage. And now, let's review. Even though we were dead in transgressions and slaves to sin, because God is rich in mercy and love, he made us alive with Christ, raised us with Christ, and seated us with Christ, so that he could display the glory of his grace and goodness. We are saved by grace through faith, not by works, but completely the gift of God. And God created us for good works, which he prepared for us. All right, that's all we're able to cover for this section. And I hope this has given you deeper insight, not only into the meaning of this passage, but into the profound change that God has made in your own life and the destiny he's created you for. And I pray that you would take this to heart and live out the faith, gratitude, and good works that are the appropriate response to God's salvation. In the next main section, we'll move on to the next of Paul's epistles, which is the epistle to the Philippians. And I'm looking forward to it. Thanks for watching.